time. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Just sharing my screen with you and we can start this second module. Uh, we will discuss many things today. Um, okay, so you should see my screen now. So, oh, I'm sorry, this is not the correct. <laughs> I took the wrong one. Okay, so. Okay. Um, so we will discuss today about open access and FAIR principles. So before we start, I just launched the uh, Mentimeter for you. Um, you, uh, you can go there and then uh, you can uh, um, you can go to um, menti.com and then enter the code uh, or you can uh, directly uh, go to the link. I guess maybe Ali can, can share the link with you in the chat. Um, and while you uh, take your time to vote for um, this Mentimeter, it is a simple question. Um, then we can go on and start the lesson and we will discuss today on a particular aspect of open science. We have seen in the first module that open science is an umbrella term. It comprises different actions that you can uh, embrace and uh, and uh, embed in your workflow. Uh, so today we go into the deep details of how uh, you can um, open access your publication, uh, your research data, and also your other results, for example, the software. Uh, I just recall the, um, uh, the definition that we have seen um, uh, in the first module. So open access means free and unrestricted online access to research outputs, both text and data, but also other research results. So uh, one thing that I would like to stress here is that when we say free, uh, we uh, are referring to the end users. So of course, everything that you will uh, do and all the tools and infrastructure you will use to make your results open access uh, will have a cost. And, uh, uh, but this is not on, um, on the shoulder of uh, the, the end users that wants to access your results. We have learned uh, in the first module again that open access doesn't mean paying for publishing. And um, we will see now uh, what this means. Uh, in practice, uh, you have to follow uh, some simple steps um, that I am, uh, I am describing now. Uh, these steps rely on the fact that, that we already have uh, good infrastructures that allow us to deposit and share our results. Uh, and uh, as you may recall, uh, these are open access repositories. We, we have seen the slides before and I just highlighted that in many cases, your institution uh, does have already a repository. Um, or you can go and check if your specific thematic of, or disciplinary community um, maintains an open repository. And uh, we will, in this part of the course, discuss about how to use literature repositories and also catch all repositories uh, because they can also contain text. So when I speak about literature, I, um, I mean uh, text. Uh, basically documents. So we are, uh, you have to think about uh, the, the, the articles you write, but also reports. Uh, it is important to, to share, for example, project deliverables and, uh, and uh, other kind of documents that you may think could be um, useful for others. So how to perform open access to scientific literature? It is quite easy. Um, you have two ways 
uh, you can do that. You can either choose a gold open access um, journal. We have seen that in these journals, uh, you your article will um, be uh, available in open access to everyone from the very first moment of publication. Uh, we have seen that not all uh, these kind of journals uh, apply APC to the authors. Uh, we will discuss this in details in, in a while. Um, so it's not always true that you have to pay for publishing in this kind of, of uh, uh, journals. Uh, but indeed, they will make your content uh, available to everyone to read. Uh, immediately. Then the second, um, the second uh, way that you have uh, to perform open access to literature is what we call the green road. So um, when um, you uh, publish a paper in a journal, uh, you can always uh, share um, with the with the with the world in open access a version of your paper. Uh, wherever this paper has been published, uh, you can use this version and deposit it in an open archive, so in a repository. And still, uh, you can do this in compliance with the copyrights regulations. Um, so what happens is that the editors may require an embargo period, uh, which um, is the period uh, that lasts between the deposit and uh, the uh, the openness of your paper. So basically, if the uh, uh, the you publish a paper today, you can deposit immediately your paper in our repository, and then you can apply an embargo period, which means that according to the policy uh, of uh, the publisher, uh, suppose this publisher uh, puts an embargo period of 12 months, uh, you can um, set the repository to open um, the, the the attachment, so the paper, um, in twelve months from now, from from the date of the publishing. Uh, once you um, are using a repository to share uh, your article, but this uh, actually holds for all kind of material that you can you can deposit. You should. Uh, guarantee the reuse and uh, for papers so what you can do is that you can set an open license uh, for people to reuse your paper. Usually uh, you can use for example creative commons, we will see them in a moment and uh, so you could ask people to openly um, reuse your material and uh, possibly um, cite you, uh, for example. But we will see details in a moment. Uh, what are uh, the versions of uh, a paper that you can deposit in a repository? Well, they depend uh, on the um, on the policy of your editor. Uh, and these are three versions. So we have the preprint, which is your uh, final draft that you submitted to the journal. Uh, this is your original manuscript and uh, does not contain the comments of the peer review process. So it is the first version you sent to the editor uh, for submission. Um, be aware that for some journals, uh, you um, the, the preprint you sent must be original. So um, if you already uh, deposit this in a preprint server, for example, some journals will not accept your paper for publication. But uh, it is often the case that uh, this is the only version that you can uh, share with others. Okay, so preprint are very useful because uh, they their copyrights usually remains within the author. So what happens is that after you published your paper, at least you can deposit the preprint in a repository. Uh, one thing and one comment that I have here is that um, is actually very often the case that uh, preprint are not so different from the published version 
uh, what happens often is that if the preprint contains major error or uh, is not um, in a good shape, it's usually rejected with the, um, from, by the reviewers. Uh, and it's not so often that we see major revision to be applied to the preprint. So usually the preprint gives a very good idea of the contents of the final uh, version uh, that is published. So uh, they are good for scientists that can read them uh, in, um, in advance with respect to to the uh, to the published version, which is often, as you have seen, closed uh, behind a paywall. So uh, the second version that you can uh, usually deposit is what it is called uh, the postprint or accepted manuscript. This is the final version. Uh, including the reviewer comments, and it is identical to the published one, except for the editorial uh, layout. So for the number of columns, uh, the shape, uh, the, the dimension of the figures, or the name, volume, and date for uh, the, um, the journal that you published your paper in. So uh, the final version can be the editorial PDF or published version. So this is the exact version that you publish, you see published in the journal website with layout and graphic that are typical to the journal. Usually this version is available for deposit in your repository uh, for open access journals um, and is, as said, identical in the contents to the postprint. So these are the three versions that you can choose uh, to deposit in your repository. And how do you know which one? Uh, well, each, each uh, journal has a specific policy on deposit uh, and embargo periods. And you can check it through a very uh, easy and a tool to use, which is Sherpa Romeo database. I, I am leaving you the link. Uh, so this database uh, basically tells you what you can do with each of these versions uh, for the different uh, journals. So it is very useful. You will learn very very easily that if if you are uh, if you usually um, um, publish in the same journals, then uh, it's uh, a matter of starting and, and getting to know the rules, and then uh, you will be able to do this uh, very quickly. Uh, one other resource that I would like to mention here is that there is uh, what is called a directory of open access journals that can help you in uh, finding an open access journal in your field. Uh, this directory is um, a curated directory. Journals in here have to apply uh, to enter the directory and there is a very good check by the um, uh, editorial board of the DOIJ. Uh, they also apply some uh, um, kind of uh, seal to the best open access journals that follow specific uh, rules. Uh, so this is a good uh, resource that you can use also uh, to, um, uh, to distinguish between uh, uh, scientific uh, publications and uh, what uh, you may know are called the predatory journals. Now this direct is curated and uh, and uh, it is periodically checked so um, you are almost pretty sure that predatory journals do not fit into this directory uh, you can also use another good tool to distinguish between uh, a good and not good um, publisher or journal which is this uh, think check submit uh, and uh, you you can use it to uh, to understand whether your um, venue for publication is a good one or not, uh, independently on uh, the fact that this is an open access or not open access journal. 
Okay, so I uh, have some tips for you for some uh, uh, some journals that are quite familiar in your in your community. So this is uh, um, a, a screenshot from uh, the uh, Sherpa Romeo uh, directory. So as you can see here, you will find uh, some um, general conditions. Sorry, uh, general conditions for um, for the journals. It's going to tell you uh, whether you can deposit to your uh, preprint or postprint and under which condition in this case you see you can either deposit the preprint and postprint and not the published version okay so you can read also the statements and check uh, because there is a link um, the uh, the policy of the specific journal Okay, so it says that you can use your institutional repository uh, or a funder agency repository uh, and so on. And so you are, uh, you can use that as, as your repository. One thing that I would like to highlight here is that uh, um, ResearchGate, Academia the EDU, Mandli, or, or Sci-Hub, as you may imagine, are not considered as uh, some sites where you can deposit a copy of your, your manuscript. This you may have to know because many researchers today, for example, are, are sharing um, original uh, published uh, articles uh, in ResearchGate and Academia.edu, but this is not uh, does not comply uh, with uh, the rules of the journals, and they violate actually copyrights. It is a news of uh, some years ago that um, I think it was Springer issued um, asked to be to um, ResearchGate to remove one. 0.5 million or something uh, articles that were um, that were uploaded to the to this platform. Uh, so this is not legal. You have to know, and uh, you should instead use your institutional or funder repository. So this is another example that uh, that you have, and here as well you see that you can either um, you can either deposit your uh, preprint or postprint version in a repository, and you also have the link again to the uh, policy of of uh, the publisher. Uh, and what you can see here. Uh, is that you can uh, publish uh, uh, the postprint, so they call it here the um, uh, author's accepted manuscript, uh, after, and you can deposit and then make available your version after uh, 12 months, so there is an embargo period to apply. Okay, so having said that, and um, the, the, what, how you can apply the, the rules for open access to your, um, to your publication, uh, I would like to discuss with you uh, about the Plan S. You probably already heard about this. Uh, it has been quite a revolution in the field, so it's interesting to discuss the details. So Plan S, is an initiative that was launched in late 2018. And uh, it was uh, um, an initiative, it is an initiative that is supported by a coalition of funders so uh, we will see them in a moment. Uh, but the main goal of Plan S is that uh, starting from next year, scientific publications that result from research which is funded by public grants uh, and by those funders, of course, must be published in compliant open access journals or platform. Uh, by saying open access journals of platform, the plan S um, makes a list of requirements. Uh, basically, you um, cannot uh, publish in hybrid journals. So we have seen these hybrid journals are those asking both for submission to read and APC uh, to open access a single paper. Uh, they require no embargo period, 
um, this is very important because uh, in this case, um, the the what what you do, you can do is either publishing in fully uh, gold open access journals or um, in uh, or or uh, journals that provide you um, the deposit. Uh, in compliance with the copyright, uh, or if better, the contrary, a copyright uh, agreement uh, which is uh, compliant with the fact that you can deposit uh, your uh, post print into a, uh, a repository, an open repository. So, as we said, uh, the Coalition S is a group of funders, organizations, and initiatives that have endorsed. The, uh, uh, the plan, as you can see, the European Commission is uh, one of the uh, one of the member of of this coalition. We have uh, also other uh, many other members. Uh, what are the consequences? Well, uh, I said that this plan was launched in late 2018, and what happened is that uh, the the plan S led to. Um, um, uh, the fact that institutions and countries uh, tried to uh, change the way the contracts uh, for the services of the fund of the uh, publisher were um, uh, were drafted. So uh, they went for what. Uh, we call today transformative agreements. Uh, basically, uh, large institutions or countries uh, are contracting different publishing models to allow their researchers to publish in open access all their works instead of paying uh, to give access and read uh, the article that others uh, right. So these kind of contacts, contracts are called publish and read. So basically, the amount of money that the institutions and the country are uh, are giving to the publisher serve to um, both read the contents of the journal and to publish everything that is, that comes from this country or that institution in the journal itself. One of the main uh, characteristic of Plan S and transformative agreement is that uh, the contract contents must be published and publicly available. So transparency is one of the main um, uh, main characteristics of transformative agreements. What happened was that many many countries uh, and many institutions or coalitions of institutions uh, joined these uh, transformative agreements and uh, what happened is that many deals were um, uh, were actually signed uh, with also big publisher you see Springer Nature or also Elsevier and and many others there is a complete list by country and by institution that is available uh, in the ESAC initiative uh, website, uh, so you can go and check whether your country or uh, or institution already signed some some transformative agreement. One important thing is that these agreements are called transformative because uh, their main goal is to um, uh, to go from uh, the current uh, business models for scientific publishing to a full. Uh, open access business model. So these agreements need to contain a statement from the publisher that um, uh, that they will uh, transform um, the business model of that specific journal into uh, a fully gold open access uh, journal. Okay, so Plan S also makes um, uh, um, makes available a good uh, journal checker tool. So basically, um, in case you do not know whether uh, your um, combination of uh, journal that you choose to publish in uh, the uh, compliance to the rules of your funder and of your institution, um, whether it is or not uh, compliant with the Plan S, so you can simply check by using this tool. Okay, so uh, I will uh, stop here the um, uh, the discussion about the um, 
this um, literature open access. So before I go uh, to the um, to the part that regards the fair fairness and fair principle, uh, I'm going to see you. I, I see you have some questions. So, okay, someone is asking where we can find the slides from the last session, sent a link, but I didn't find the slides. Um, uh, I will put the slides in Zenodo, apologies, I didn't have time to do that yet, but uh, the idea is that you will find the Zenodo. I, I know Amad is here, so maybe Amad, you can also explain where people can find the link. Uh, yes, precisely. I think uh, the way we will proceed is, uh, yeah, using Zenodo to share openly the uh, the slides, and uh, we will of course then also link uh, to to these uh, presentations on the Tricera website. Okay. Uh, there will be a, de a dedicated section um, for uh, the one dedicated for open science, and we'll probably dedicate a page for the webinar. So um, all the links will be shared with you as soon as possible. Okay, great. Uh, so um, there is another question uh, from uh, Julia, I think. Um, the version that you send as a second revision paper after a revise and resubmit result, but before the final reviewer's comments, is this also a preprint? Uh, in other words, sometimes you send several versions of uh, to the journal before it is accepted. The preprint can be the last version you sent before accepted with final reviewer comments. The answer is no. So the preprint is only your original manuscript, the, the one that you sent uh, in the first um, uh, submission process. Okay, so this is your original manuscript that has nothing um, that includes no comments from from the reviewers okay whereas while you the the version that you send um, the subsequent versions uh, if you have more than one um, uh, discussion with the reviewers uh, are, uh, let's say, um, we can call them a preliminary version, but the, what it counts is that you have a distinction between the preprint that does not contain the reviewer's comments, and then you have the postprint, which is identical in the contents to the um, final published version. Okay, so um, of course uh, the only difference can be uh, some minor uh, changes in the in the layout of the version uh, and uh, the editorial, of course, uh, um, editing. Okay, so I hope I answered your question. Um, okay, I don't know if there are any other questions from for this. Uh, I see there is a discussion in the chat. No, no, no. Okay, no others. Yet. Okay. Okay, so um, before I go uh, in this, um, I, I start the, uh, the fairness. Uh, what I would like to share with you is the results of uh, the Mentimeter. So uh, the Mentimeter was asking you uh, whether your data is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So uh, uh, this is what you answered. So you basically think that your data is highly findable uh, and accessible. OK. Uh, you uh, think also that your data is re reusable and in a certain way is also interoperable. OK, that is good to, uh, this is good to know. I just leave you a few moments. I see some, someone is, is voting still. Uh, and then um, we will close this, uh, this voting. And uh, we will then go and, and, uh, and go on with our lesson. Okay, so I'm closing the voting now, just to freeze this image, and then let's discuss now about uh, the FAIR principles. Okay, first of all, we will need some definitions, uh, a couple of them, not many things. Uh, digital object. So in the context of this presentation, uh, I refer to any research results 
in its digital form that can be uploaded and eventually open shared uh, in a repository. So uh, a digital object can be an article, a data set, a piece of software, an image, video, uh, a presentation, uh, or a conference poster, and uh, whatever you can consider our research results. So um, the other thing uh, that you have to keep in mind during this lesson is that when you deposit something in our repository, uh, you are uh, creating a new record of the repository. This new record is composed of two parts. Uh, the first one is the payload. So it is the physical digital object, how to say the file that you are uploading. These can be one or more files and uh, uh, can contain different, uh, can, can be files in different formats. Uh, the payload can include, the, the, for example, a data set in a, um, uh, in a spreadsheet uh, and, for example, any accompanying material like uh, a readme file or whatever you think uh, may be included in a single record. Then on the other side, you have the metadata. Uh, the metadata is a set of data that describes your digital object, so the payload, uh, that you are depositing, okay? So uh, in these slides, uh, you see a screenshot from Zenodo, and you can see that we have in the central parts, uh, in the violet case, uh, the, the file. So if you click on the file, you can download it. Uh, and then you have in blue the parts that uh, represent uh, the metadata of this, uh, of this object. So you have the date of submission, you have uh, the, the access right, this is an open access, you have uh, the type of resource, this is a lesson, uh, you have the title, you have the authors, you have the description, uh, and then uh, you can have also technical information like uh, uh, the GOI, for example, keywords, um, uh, you can see from here which uh, projects, which grants um, were used to to produce this, um, this record and so on. You also have the versioning, of course. Uh, so um, the record consists both in the payload, so the files and the metadata. Okay, so having said that, we can start and go into the details of uh, the FAIR principles. Uh, so uh, first of all, um, the FAIR principles indicate a list of principles, of course, uh, that can help you uh, in making your data ready for open science. They are principles and not standards. So uh, the thing is, um, there is no single way to apply the FAIR principle to all science. It really depends on um, the discipline and on uh, the specific uh, way uh, you apply a, a workflow to your work. Okay, so it both depends on the context and on how you work. Um, these principles were designed to enable an optimal use of research data and methods. So uh, when I say use, I mean reuse also by others. Um, the FAIR principles were designed uh, in two years time by a group of different experts. Um, so it, there was a very uh, big uh, discussion about the FAIR principle. And what they did, they listed a set of 15 principles. Now, these principles are very technical. So um, I'm not going to go into the details of what the single principles say, but I will leave you the link uh, you will find in my presentation to go and check. Uh, I will give you today more a flavor of what is uh, the meaning of this FAIR principle and how you can apply them to your workflow. So first of all, what does FAIR mean? Um, well, FAIR is an acronym. It means findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. 
Now let me start from the last one, reusable, because this is the goal of the application of the FAIR principle. Reusable means that your data can be reused by others in new research. Uh, so uh, this is the goal that you have to keep in mind when you try to apply the FAIR principle to your results. Always keep in mind that everything that you do is because someone may reuse your results. Uh, findable means that uh, your data or your result is uh, findable by others. Uh, so other can find your data and they can even cite it. Uh, accessible means that your data is accessible to others. Uh, we have seen that this doesn't mean that your data must be open, but it means that you have to clearly state who will have access when and how to your results. Interoperable uh, means that uh, your data uh, can be integrated with other data and or they can be easily used and read by max machines. Okay, so um, it means uh, making your data um, interoperable with others and also uh, with uh, um, automatic workflow or uh, application or uh, computers or whatever. Okay, so um, next is uh, these slides that allows me to, uh, to tell you that there is a life cycle for uh, your data. Start for, from the planning, uh, collection or creation of data, processing and analyze, uh, publish and share, preserve and reuse. This life cycle um, is uh, uh, strongly, the, the FAIR principle are strongly interconnected with this uh, data life cycle, but it is not possible to uh, connect a single principle to a single step of this life cycle. So everything that you do, do uh, during the life cycle of your data uh, can um, interfere with the application of uh, the FAIR principles. Uh, again, I would like to stress that applying the FAIR principles doesn't mean that you have to openly share research data. So FAIR data doesn't mean open data. What is the difference? Okay, so open data are data that can be freely used, shared, enriched by anyone, anywhere, and for any purpose. Um, FAIR data instead are data that follow a series of good practices that allow data access still respecting any ethical, legal and contractual, contractual restriction. So why am I telling you that? Because your research data could in principle contain personal information. So uh, you will fall under the privacy and GDPR uh, restrictions for sharing. Uh, your data could fall under the copyright. So in the case of a database with creative structure, for example, or could fall under the sui generis rights. Uh, so uh, which um, are databases that are obtained thanks to a substantial investment can be protected by patent or industrial secrets. So some data cannot be shared openly. Okay, so and data sharing needs to respect the specific law and framework where your data were created. Data needs to be protected against uh, uh, non-authorized access. This is very important. So for example, think of uh, clinical data or personal uh, information. So the question is, how can you adhere to the FAIR principle if your data cannot be opened? Well, you can still, uh, by managing correctly your data and create and share a description of your data. Uh, by doing this, other researchers may ask for permission to ask, access your data for reuse purposes, and they can give a specific aim and following the rules that are defined by the law. So in this case, you can apply what is called restrict 
access to the record payload, so to the files, but not to the metadata. So still you can share the metadata, but close the access to a specific payload files. So let's go into the details of, um, of uh, uh, good practices that you can apply uh, to make your data fair. What will happen to your data when, when you will apply the FAIR principle? Well, first of all, you will learn today that um, applying the FAIR principle will make you think and plan um, uh, in a good way your uh, data life cycle. So basically, you will produce high quality data. Uh, you will maximize the impact of your research uh, because people will get to know that uh, you have a good quality uh, results. Um, you will improve the recognition within and also behind your research community. Uh, as I said in, uh, in uh, the beginning, uh, the application of the FAIR principle strongly depends on the specific context and discipline and on the way uh, a single researcher works. Okay, so um, here uh, no one size fits all. But why should you apply the FAIR principle uh, and why do you need them? Uh, the ultimate goal, uh, we, we, we saw it a few minutes ago, is that you are doing all this to make your uh, data or your digital object, your result, reusable and also safe. This is quite important because you will provide, um, uh, you, you will make your data reusable to others, but you will also make your data safe uh, and so you will not lose your data. Um, this is the main goal uh, that, uh, as I said, you will have to keep in mind when you try to apply the FAIR principle to your results. So the, the main question is, are my results reusable by someone that was not involved in its collection or creation? This is a very important question that you have to keep in mind that you, you will have to answer when you, for example, uh, are choosing some tools or are um, uh, choosing a strategy to apply the FAIR principle. So how can you make your data FAIR? Um, we have some basics for fair verification. These are the elements that uh, you will have to work with. First of all is the documentation. These uh, will make your data understandable by others, by giving the context where the data were created. Uh, metadata uh, will make your data easy to find uh, because they describe your data, so people will use your metadata to understand what is inside the payload. Data formats are key because uh, they make your data simple. Uh, they make your data simple to combine to other data and they also make data machine readable. Um, access to data means uh, a strategy to say who, when and how can have access to your data. Persistent identifiers are another key element. Um, they link, um, are, are a persistent link to data that follow, uh, that allows others to find insight, so give credit to your data. And then licenses, of course, that are used to tell others what uh, they can do with your data. So let's go through this list of, uh, of elements one by one. Uh, documentation, it specifies the context that led to the creation or collection of your data and they make the data understandable to others. Uh, in the beginning of your project activity, and this is the planning phase, uh, you will have to clearly define uh, a strategy to structure and document your data. This is very important because uh, you may want to use a specific methods, tools, software. Um, you will have to uh, detail uh, the metadata that you want to use. Uh, you will have to detail the processes. So who worked with the data, what they did with the data and what are the relation to other data or uh, other results, for example, publications. 
Um, these elements need to be uh, detailed uh, and thinking of them from the very beginning will uh, ease your work, okay, because Many times, for example, in the documentation, in the description of the data, if you do not uh, uh, think um, about what you're doing and what you will do with the data, it will be um, it will be difficult to uh, to go uh, back into the the past and change, uh, for example, your method or or the tools you use to generate the data. So this is a very important uh, thing that you have to plan from the very beginning. Metadata. Uh, what are metadata? We have learned that they are data, describing data. Uh, they are very important for accessing the data, um, uh, understand the data and process them. So here is a parallel to uh, um, a photo and the metadata for, for a picture. So uh, in here you see that we have some standard information like the format, for example, uh, JPEG, uh, the dates uh, where we took this picture, um, the name of the file, uh, but then we also have, uh, for example, the information about the camera that was used to take this picture, uh, and also the settings of the specific settings of the camera when we took the pictures. So all of this information is contained into the metadata. Uh, why it is important, uh, for example, to use specific standards, because you will spend less time in creating and interpreting the data uh, if you use the standards of your discipline. And also, uh, you can spend more time to actually make and, and perform science. Um, metadata can help in making your data findable, uh, interoperable and reusable. Uh, there is a very large list of types uh, of different types of metadata standard. We have specific standards for uh, discipline. Uh, so for example, uh, the data documentation initiative gives us some ideas about the standards in the social science and humanities. Uh, but we also have general uh, metadata schema that we can use to uh, describe basically everything. Uh, the Dublin Core um, is one of these, so uh, it's quite generic. Uh, uh, we'll tell you about the title, the authors, the subject, and so on. Um, it is always good to use uh, the standards of your discipline if uh, it is widely used by the community, uh, whereas uh, general standards can be used uh, in case you do not have a specific standard for the metadata in uh, your discipline. Accessibility. Uh, now the question here is uh, how can I make uh, can I make my data accessible to others? We have seen that not all the data uh, can be accessible. Uh, who will be granted access and how? So these are the questions that you have to think about when you uh, when you will plan the accessibility to your data. Um, so uh, now we go and discuss a little bit of the the, um, the FAIR principle in, in large. So findable. The first step uh, in reusing someone else's data is to find them, of course. So it will be crucial that your data adhere to this principle. Metadata and data should be easy to find for both humans and machines. Um, and uh, machine readable metadata are essential for automatic discovery of data set and also of services. Uh, so this is an, uh, an essential part of the verification process. Some definition again that will help us in understand how we can make our data findable. Persistent identifiers. Uh, persistent identifier is a long lasting reference to a document, a file, a web page, or any other object. Uh, when I say long lasting, in principle, will mean uh, forever. Uh, of course, uh, this is not uh, possible, but we have to um, uh, we have to um, make sure that this link uh, will will uh, last for a very long time. 
Um, this is usually a term that we use in the context of the digital objects that are accessible of the internet. And typically, uh, for this reason, um, the identifier are not only persistent, but also actionable. What it means, it means that you can plug it into a web browser and be taken directly to the identified source. So some examples in the open science context are the ORCID ID. Uh, this is an alphanumeric code that uniquely identify a scientific or other academic authors or contributors. If you do not have the one yet, you should, because this will allow you to be findable also over the years. So in five, 10 years time, uh, you may have, uh, you may work for a different institutions and it could be um, difficult for others to find you. So uh, in case you have an ORCID ID, it will be very easy to understand, for example, where uh, you currently work. Uh, a DOI is another uh, kind of, uh, uh, of persistent identifier, uh, and it is used to identify uh, object and it's, it's a standardized, um, it's a standardized um, identifier. So um, it's, it is still a, a persistent identifier, but uh, it's standard. It's also standard. Uh, a DOI um, aims to be resolvable. So um, uh, this is also a, a very important uh, um, characteristic. Um, what they do is that they bind the DOI to the metadata um, and um, about the, the object, for example, a, a URL. So they, they will uh, always tell you where to find the object. Uh, an example is this, of course, uh, uh, for example, publisher um, uh, release a DOI for the single article. So, so if you take the DOI of your article and, and you uh, put it into the, uh, your web browser, you will be linked directly uh, to the publisher page where you can uh, find the article. Uh, persistent identifiers are very useful uh, because they make your data findable and accessible. Uh, if you will uh, read the 15 um, uh, FAIR principle as they are defined, you will find that, that persistent identifier are a key element in this 15 principle. How can you assign a DOI, a persistent identifier, to your object? You do not have to care because a persistent identifier will, are often assigned by institutions and by repositories. So uh, your repository will probably assign a persistent identifier to your digital object. Uh, for example, Zenodo assigns a DOI to the digital objects that do not already have one. We said that persistent identifier will make your data accessible. Uh, what does uh, it mean? It means that once the user finds uh, the data, um, he or she will have to understand how they can be accessed. And uh, uh, these can also include an auth authentication or authorization process. Um, but how can you give access to your, um, your results? Again, uh, you uh, can use a repository. We have seen, we have many types of repository. We can distinguish them by um, the uh, who by who is curating uh, uh, and uh, and uh, using the repository. So uh, we can uh, see that we can either have thematic or disciplinary repositories uh, like archive, for example, or institutional or national repositories. For example, France has a national repository, which is called HAL. Um, and typically uh, only people that um, uh, come from a specific institution or nation or um, are um, from a specific uh, discipline can use these kind of repositories. Um, on the other hand, we can uh, distinguish the repository on the contents 
uh, they host. So either we have literature repositories which are reserved to text um, or data repository. Uh, one thing that I would like to stress here is that the kind of content um, reflects into the metadata that these repository host. So for example, for literature repositories, we will use a specific kind of metadata to describe uh, the different um, text that can be deposited there. Data repository are uh, very important and they are often uh, disciplinary or thematic because they have specific metadata that fully describe the type of data uh, they can preserve. Then uh, we can have catch-all repositories that can allow you to deposit uh, different kinds of, of uh, products, for example, presentation, posters, software, uh, data, literature, whatever. This kind of repository do not have um, very um, specific metadata, but they rely on general, um, general metadata schema like the Dublin Core that we have seen. Zenodo is one of the um, most used uh, catch-all repositories. There is an important difference that you have to keep in mind. So you can use the repository to deposit, so to upload an object uh, uh, on the platform. Um, and uh, this platform will uh, implement a long-term preservation of your content. So by depositing, you will not lose your information. Uh, then uh, the other um, step that you can take is to give access. So once you have deposited the object. Uh, you as an author can choose uh, the type of access that can be granted. We can think of an open access so everyone can access without restriction, a restricted access, and it is the author that will uh, um, set up a strategy uh, to, um, to say who, when, and uh, how they, uh, will, they can uh, ask for permission to be granted access. Closed access means that no one can even ask uh, you to uh, be granted access. And then you have the embargoed one, which is the one that we have seen. You basically first deposit and then you open the payload just after uh, a period of time. Uh, giving access also means to assign a license to reuse the contents and usually we can use the Creative Commons that we will see in a while. These are the access rights in Zenodo. Uh, other repository have more than four access rights. Uh, for example, sometimes uh, if they are institutional, they will uh, have an access which is provided only to those that, um, uh, that work for these institutions uh, and so on. But these are the main ones that you can find. So we have the open access, which means that everyone anytime from everywhere can access uh, uh, the contents uh, and use uh, and for any purpose. Um, and then you can see here that when you apply the open access button, then you will have to specify a license for reuse. Um, there is uh, what it is called the embargoed access. We have talked about this uh, a few minutes ago. So here you will be able to define the embargo date, which will be the date when your payload will be opened. Uh, so uh, everything will be granted open access rights. And then here again, you have to specify the license in the uh, very first moment of deposit because um, the embargo will finish and then the record will open automatically. So you will have to define the license immediately. Uh, for what concerns uh, the uh, restricted access, this is how Zenodo implements it. So you will have uh, to fill in uh, this module for conditions. Uh, you will be free to, um, uh, to apply whatever conditions you want to your, uh, uh, to your record. So uh, decide who and how and, and when they can, they can uh, ask for uh, be granted access. 
regarding Zenodo, it happens that you, uh, if a user wants to uh, to um, access your record, uh, they can. Um, they can click on a button and uh, they can send you a message through the platform. So uh, the uh, the people asking will not uh, be given your uh, email address, but they will send you a message through the platform and you will receive a notification in your email. And they will have to provide um, uh, a, a specific request. So they will have to provide the, the, the proof that they follow under the conditions that you listed. Then you could uh, uh, decide to grant access, and uh, what happens is that you will send them a, a private link that they can use only once to download the resources and to access it. Okay, then the last type of access is, of course, the closed access. Uh, here, as you can see, you do not have to uh, specify any licenses because uh, these information that it is stored in closed access is not meant for be uh, reused by others. This is a warning because uh, when you attach your data uh, to the article that you published uh, by, for example, sending an Excel file to the publisher, this does not mean that you are depositing the data. Uh, so journals uh, do not guarantee a long-term preservation of the attachments and the curation of the data. You are simply sending it uh, like you uh, could do uh, via email. Okay, so this doesn't mean to apply the FAIR principle and to deposit your data in a secure space. Uh, how can you uh, grant open access to uh, research data? Uh, you have to consider where uh, your data will be stored. So where you, sh you, you will deposit, uh, you should find a trusted repository. Um, of course, it is better to use disciplinary repository if they are available. If not, Zenodo is a very good solution because it is already, for example, connected with OpenAir and with your funders. So uh, it is good to use Zenodo um, also for this reason. Um, disciplinary repository, uh, how to find them, you can use the Retree data. And of course, when you are depositing, uh, you should provide full metadata according to your discipline standards. Um, so when you compile the, the metadata form, be sure that you include all the necessary information. Do not limit to the um, mandatory fields, but also include other information that can be useful to others. Then after you deposit, you can open your data. We have seen sometimes you can't, but in this case, we are discussing how to open access the data that can be opened. Um, you can apply an, embar an embargo period, uh, also thinking of your pr specific project. Uh, and you should choose the most open license possible. So we are talking about the CC0 or the CC BY. Uh, documentation. Of course, please attach all useful documentation um, about how the data uh, was, was uh, collected um, and deposit the data set, okay? Um, interoperability. Um, usually when you are uh, working on others' data, uh, you are um, often requested to integrate uh, with other data, maybe with data you have collected or, or also with others. Um, in addition, uh, we have seen that uh, the data need uh, to interoperate with applications or workflows for analysis, for example, storage and processing. So using community standards and best practices uh, is key to achieve interoperability. Uh, some repositories also give you some extra tools that you can use to um, allow for a larger interoperability. For example, in Zenodo, uh, you are able to link um, other digital objects. So you can provide uh, the uh, identifier, uh, not necessarily a DOA, but you can also provide a handle uh, or another kind of ID for, for your uh, resource. Then uh, you can describe what kind of resource you are linking. 
for example, if you are depositing in Zenodo a, a data set, uh, it may be useful to link it to a paper uh, that describes this data set or, or that was uh, conceived thanks to the data set. So uh, you, can, uh, you can say which kind of resource you are linking and you can also uh, identify uh, the, um, uh, the relation between the object that, that you are depositing and the one that you are citing. Reusability, uh, as we have seen, uh, this is the ultimate goal of FAIR, so optimize the reuse of data. To achieve this, uh, metadata and data should be well described so that they can be replicated and or combined in different settings. Uh, in order to be reusable, uh, you should specify a license, so you should tell others how they can reuse your data, and you should specify the provenance, so where is your data coming from. Um, we have seen that not all the data can be shared uh, because they can be either automatically protected by the law or regulated by contract uh, or sometimes they can be subject to community norms uh, uh, or academic best practices. Uh, so just to give you some considerations um, for data protection. Okay, so copyright is a property right in certain types of original, literary, artistic, and scientific works. Copyright does not protect idea. Instead, uh, you can use confidentiality to protect, for example, confidential information. So um, these may be, uh, for example, uh, written in a contract uh, or their information may be uh, marked as confidential. Uh, in this case, uh, you are not allowed to share it. Uh, the use of confidential information might give rise, of course, as you may understand, to claim for uh, compensation if confidentiality is breached. Is breached. So uh, please be sure that uh, the data is not uh, confidential if you want to share it. Uh, data subject rights arise in information that identifies individuals and are recognized by data protection laws in the EU, so the GDPR and privacy. Uh, some uh, patents uh, are registered, uh, 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 patents are registered rights in novel inventions of products or processes. Uh, and uh, one thing that I would like to stress here is that when dealing with research, if you want to patent something, you should not publish it before. Uh, this is because in order to deposit a patent, uh, you will need to uh, prove that uh, the invention that you are patenting was not published before. So if you write an article and then you want to patent something, this is not uh, the way you should do it. Uh, you should first register the patent and then you uh, could in principle um, write an article about the same, uh, the same invention. Now, for some um, journals, this is not uh, allowed. So uh, you should uh, uh, submit, in principle, novel um, uh, novel papers. So uh, a patent, which is already registered, uh, could be uh, intended as a, uh, an already available publication. So um, it is often the case that, that if you patent something, uh, a publisher could say, uh, we will not accept this for publication. Okay, so uh, bear in mind that, that if you want to patent something, the first thing you should do is to patent and then uh, you can maybe uh, uh, search for, for uh, the possibility to publish it. Uh, um, also, uh, keep in mind that the patenting uh, is a very long process, so for some inventions um, it will take, of course, a long time. 
uh, and this may uh, uh, and and uh, after this time the invention may become obsolete and uh, uh, probably uh, the the fact that you want to to publish it will be um, not uh, not any more convenient um okay so the the last thing is that some research data be, may not benefit from any legal protection as we have seen for specific uh, um, uh, information confidential information or or um, individual information but in in some cases some moral and ethical considerations may apply so this is what you have to know to understand the how you can you can protect your data one thing that you have to keep in mind is that data is legally speaking not yours um, this is because data it is not considered intellectual work uh, so no copyright can apply uh, what can happen is that um, some um, uh, some protection may act on uh, the way uh, you uh, present and you collected your data uh, because copyright protection covers expression and not idea, procedures, operating methods or mathematical concepts as such, but the protection is instead on the databases and not the data. So uh, the data uh, are protected only and especially when they are collected and organized in a specific way. We will see what the law consider a database, which is not what we usually think when we hear uh, the word database. Um, then there is another thing to consider because in Europe and only in Europe we have what is called a sui generis database rights. So this covers not only the reproduction and dissemination of the database, but also the extractions and reuse of substantial part in the database. So um, some consideration about data and law protection. Raw data are not protected by copyright. In fact, there is no uh, legal definition of data. Instead, the law gives us a definition of a database, which is defined as a collection of independent works, data, or other materials arranged in a systematic or methodological way. This is uh, something that you can protect by copyright you cannot protect the raw data itself. So the copyright protects, again, uh, not the, the raw data contained, but the structure, the selection, or the arrangement of the database contents. So the part that is, um, is uh, defined as an intellectual work. So the way you, um, you are using to structure, select, or arrange, uh, the data within a database. Uh, we we see we saw that in Europe we also have a, a what uh, we call sui generis database rights. This protects the substantial effort in obtaining data and not creating the data. So um, usually in this case, the right owner is often the institution and not. Uh, the author, so not the researcher, but the institution you work for. Um, so in this case, um, th this is a schema that, that summarizes what I try to, to describe here. So on the raw data, you have the no protection uh, by law, so no copyrights. Um, for non-creative database, if in case that they, uh, there was a substantial effort for obtaining the data, you can apply the sui generis rights. For database that are creative, you could both apply the copyright on the structure uh, of, of the database, uh, and you can also apply the sui generis rights in case uh, uh, there was a, um, a substantial effort for obtaining the data. This doesn't mean that you are not the author of the data, it just means that you will not 
own any rights on the data. So uh, are you the author of the data you collected? Yes, in case you can prove it. And how can you prove it? You can prove it by deposit uh, with a clear date, a DOI, so if you use a repository. Um, so you will be the author of the specific data set. If uh, the, the question is, do you own any rights on the raw data you collected? The answer is no, because data is a fact and no one can own rights on a fact. Uh, creative commons. So um, we have seen during the, this lesson today that you should um, tell people what they can do with uh, your resources. Okay, the resources that you make available. Now, not all of us are legal experts, uh, so we are not, uh, in principle, all capable of writing proper licenses. But uh, there is this framework, which is called Creative Commons uh, and Public Domain, that um, create a sort of legal certainty for everyone who wants to work, uh, to use works that are licensed um, with this framework. Okay, so it is very easy to use and to understand. Uh, there are some simple rules that uh, you have to follow um, uh, to understand the meaning of the licenses and to use them. So first of all, uh, Creative Commons uh, uh, give a, a worldwide license to anyone to copy, copy and publish uh, the content. Uh, this is allowed for all the combinations. Um, in case you want to require an attribution, so in case you want people to cite and to say, to state that uh, they used uh, these resources that was provided by you, you can apply uh, the BY license. So CC BY means that uh, people that are using your resource will have to cite you. Um, in case you do not want to uh, allow a commercial use of uh, uh, your resource, then you can apply uh, the NC, so non-commercial license. Now, here I want to make a point because as you have learned that during the first module, uh, uh, scientific publishing, it is indeed a commercial use because it is, uh, they are commercial uh, platforms. So um, in case you apply a non-commercial license to, for example, um, your data set, uh, others will not be able to use your data set to, um, uh, to write a scientific paper. So please use this non-commercial license uh, properly. Um, then you can tell people whether they can modify or adapt uh, your work um, in another shape. So uh, in this case, if you do not want people to modify or adapt uh, your work, what you can say is that you can apply uh, the um, uh, non-derivative uh, license, ND. Uh, then uh, what you can also do is that you can tell people how they will be able to share uh, derivative works. Uh, in this case, you can use the share alike license that um, make it, makes it mandatory uh, for people to um, license any uh, modification or uh, adaption of, of your original work in the same way that you shared. Okay, so uh, there is a summary here of all the kind of licenses that you can find. Uh, I leave it for reference. Uh, again, uh, please uh, do not consider attaching uh, the, the file with your data to your publication as an um, application of the FAIR principle, okay? So please do not do that. Um, there is a very nice um, 
uh, resource that I want to cite here. Uh, it is a fact sheet uh, by Creative Commons uh, and Open Science. Uh, so uh, they briefly describe uh, what is open science and why you should use the, um, uh, the Creative Commons. Uh, they basically tell you that in order to adhere to the open science principle, you should always use three kind of licenses. The most used one is the public domain. Uh, that means uh, um, indeed that the work that you are sharing uh, is not uh, covered by the copyright, but it is in the public domain, so everyone can use it. Um, CC0 means that uh, it was covered by copyright, but you basically um, um, are uh, giving away your rights and uh, you uh, can license uh, without any restriction. Um, they also are telling you some some important uh, step, for example, that do not uh, do not um, uh, think that by um, by not including the by license, so CC by to your work, this means that others will not cite you because uh, as you may know, um, it is bad science not to cite the source of your information. So if someone finds your data, which is licensed uh, in CC0, um, they still will have to say that they found that this information that they are using, for example, in their article provided by someone. And this someone, of course, is you, the author of the data set. So what Creative Commons actually uh, tells you is that you should apply the CC0 or the public domain to your data and then ask for credit and provide a clear citation that researchers that are using your data can simply copy and paste to give you credit for your work. Okay. This is a summary of what we have seen today. You have seen that um, uh, findable, uh, sorry, FAIR means findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, we have discussed about persistent identifiers, metadata, standards, uh, provenance, and so on. So uh, this is a summary that you can use to understand if you put all the elements uh, in, in your workflow in order to apply the FAIR principle. Again, once your data is fair, you can decide to go open. How do you do that? We have seen that you can use a repository. You have to uh, choose which, which kind of data can be opened uh, by keeping in mind the principle as open as possible, as closed as necessary. So just closed what cannot be open. Uh, and in practice, it is very simple because uh, you already have your uh, data in a repository because you had to follow the FAIR principle. So simply apply an open access right to your data. One thing is that is making your data FAIR, will it make it reliable? Well, the answer is no, because it depends on you. So FAIR gives you some principle and best practice that you can use to manage your data and to share it. But um, it will help you in make your data uh, have a, a, a higher quality because you will have to think uh, clearly and plan clearly your um, data life cycle, but still the content of your data is made by you. So it's you that makes uh, the data reliable. Now, um, before we go and, and discuss a little bit more in the detail to the current open science practices in uh, your domain, so in the ECT domain, I would like to go back to the, um, to the Mentimeter. So let me just close my presentation. The link is always the same. So I just reopen. Okay, Ali, did you already... Uh, uh, I opened it again because okay. some people didn't have the time to vote. Okay. And I sent the, uh, okay. Room. No problem because Thank now you. we have the same question again. So uh, after you have seen and you heard about a fair, uh, can you give another answer and tell us 
do you think now that you know what FAIR is, do you think that your data is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable? So it will be nice to see uh, what you thought before um, uh, following the lesson, if it is the same or if it is different. Okay, do we have any questions from the... Um... No, no questions. No questions, okay. Okay. Okay, we just give a moment, but I already see some difference. Uh, if the people voting now are the same as we had before, then uh, we see that uh, the previous was a bit more, I think, um, there was, okay, so just closing the vote just to see, yes, people thought that their data were more findable and accessible and also reusable than now so uh this is uh, already something so um i don't know if uh you want uh, anyone wants to comment that or we can go um why why do you think now that your data is less findable in uh, accessible and reusable than before If you want to write in the chat or raise your hand, uh, it is pretty much um, a, a matter of uh, uh, planning and designing, and then uh, you you can start using some specific tools um, that we will also provide uh, during this course. Uh, of course, the repository is very important. So choosing the right repository is key uh, to apply the FAIR principle. There is also a quite, uh, um, okay, there is a comment. I often put my data in websites that are linked to the website of my institution, but this is not a repository, yes. So one thing that I have to tell you is that putting data into a website is good. Uh, for, uh, for example, to allow people to find it, but it is not sustainable. The thing is that, for example, if you have a website uh, for your project, what will happen to this website when the project is over? Okay, think in a five or 10 years time, who will maintain this website? And then this website is basically not visible uh, to all the other infrastructures that uh, instead uh, go and find the information uh, in, uh, in the repositories, okay? So what you can do, um, you can, uh, uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> now I'm reading the comments, uh, uh, fun experience with uh, with uh, some old EU project websites. Yes, because what happens is that uh, if you do not maintain, if you do not have a plan for sustainability, what happens is that the, the information that will be stored in this website will get lost. Okay, um, whereas uh, repositories are often maintained uh, by uh, very big and uh, old institutions um, like uh, uh, university, for example, okay, um, then um, uh, or, or by, uh, by stable communities, okay. Uh, fair does not guarantee long-term preservation. What, well, this is this is. Uh, wh what do you mean, uh, Hamad? You mean that the acronym doesn't include the preservation? Well, I mean, I think this is this is a, a quite of a long debate. Um, as far as I understand, but maybe you can uh, you mm -hmm. can uh, clarify this more. Um, you know, providing your data on a, on a fair enabling data repository does not necessarily, uh, let's say, in a in a in a guaranteed way, uh, guarantee long term preservation of the data. I mean, over over which time frame your data is is preserved is not necessarily uh, clear from 
uh, a fair enabling data repository. But okay, correct me if I'm wrong. It's it's I think it's it's a long debate and and uh, it goes through different discussions over data repository certifications. But yeah. Okay, so in this case, I have to say that uh, the accessible part includes that your data should be accessible uh, for a long time. Now, we can discuss about what long time means because uh, uh, there is no, um, how to say, there is no um, identification on how long your long-term preservation means. So uh, we say usually 10 years time um, but uh, for example the the um, uh, the guidelines uh, for fairness from the European Commission does do not uh, specify how long you should preserve your data but it's long term um, certification of the repository is a very um, uh, is a discussion that that is taking place uh, now. Uh, so the thing is, uh, we already defined uh, the FAIR principle, but then we have to ensure that uh, people will uh, be able to understand whether a platform that they will use or a service that they will use to make their data FAIR is actually FAIR enabler. So um, there is uh, uh, there are some some frameworks for certification. For its, for example, um, the core trust seal is a certification, but this does not certify your your repository is fair uh, enabler. Um, there are discussion in the community right now to understand how they can say that our repository is is a fair enabler. Okay, uh, for example, if you think of the core trust seal. Uh, which is issued by, by DANS in, in the Netherlands. Uh, they certified up to now, I think, 100 repositories, uh, whereas, for example, Open Air collects information from 17,000 repositories. So you can see that this is a very, very short uh, and small um, uh, part of the repositories out there. Um, so in this moment, this is the, the um, how to say, the, the, the conversation is on how we can guarantee and, and say that something is fair and it's not. Uh, I have to say that uh, currently, uh, we are thinking of designing um, a framework where there is no in and out. So there will be no, um, how to say, strong certification in the sense that either you have the, the seal or not. But the, the, the idea is to provide a framework where you can have different uh, kind of fairness. Okay, uh, depending on uh, how you design your, your platform or your repository. So I don't know if Ellie wants to add anything about this. No, that, that, that's a very big discussion. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just know that uh, to, to enable services and repositories to be fair is not something, it's something that is uh, requires costs, uh, so it's, it's not a costless um, procedure. Uh, not all countries uh, have, uh, uh, you know, policies in place that can probably fund through those, uh, through, the, through their funding systems can fund um, the acquisition of uh, this kind of certifications. Mm -hmm. And also it's not the certification, it's that you have to, uh, you have to by the services that will uh, let you certify then your, your service. So it, mm -hmm. it's, it's too complex and uh, it's something that it's, it will take a long time and mm -hmm. the uptake will take a long time, but it's, it's, it's going towards that direction though. However, I think that we shouldn't, uh, you know, um, we should be more um, inclusive uh, today than, you know, Mm -hmm. exclude from, from that. Yes. Amada, is uh, did we answer your Yeah, yeah no no, I, yeah. I fully agree. I mean I, yeah. I think it's it's a it's a difficult question that mm -hmm. requires time and thought and research and there's you yeah. know quite some research on this. It's uh, and I agree, I mean one should be 
think also inclusive and flexible and uh, and anyway i mean it, it's an ongoing transformation so not everything will happen directly yes. in, in uh, overnight exactly. but um, it's just i think it's important to keep those issues in mind because they are they are relevant and timely questions for for research and thought Mm -hmm. Yes, there is uh, there is this discussion now, and and um, we we should be for the moment we should be as open as possible, you know, because uh, not all the repositories out there can, as Ali was was saying, there is also a, a problem of cost, so not all of them can afford the the, the cost that is asked to be uh, certified, and and also um, the numbers are so little now that. Uh, it will be impossible for everyone to to uh, access the, this kind of platforms. Okay, so uh, let's go back. So thank you. I just um, closed there the There is vote. a question. Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. sorry, I didn't see it. No, no yes. worries. So it's uh, from Alexis. Uh, domain specific repositories are often maintained by small communities, which may not stand for 10 years, let's say. Would you advise, Maximum, would you advise uh, also preserving copies of submitted data sets on generic repositories like Zenodo? Okay, yes, thank you for these questions because this, um, this is very useful to specify that uh, it is um, possible to deposit in different uh, venues. So uh, if you think this repository, which is maintained by a small community, is useful for you because this is your reference community, but you are not sure about the sustainability plan, of this repository, then you should definitely deposit also in Zenodo. Also, one other thing that I would like to stress is that Zenodo will uh, give you a DOI for your record. So probably I, I, can, I can tell that if it is a small community, uh, they are not able uh, in this specific uh, repository that you are mentioning, they are not able to provide you with a DOI. Okay, but DOIs are very important because with the DOI stands the sustainability, okay, because the DOI is a framework that is uh, standardized and the, the institutions that are granted um, the fact that, that they can uh, provide the DOIs have to uh, um, uh, have to uh, make sure that they can provide um, the link between uh, uh, the, the persistent identifier and the resource. So these are usually very large uh, institutions or uh, like Zenodo is, is um, maintained by the CERN. So uh, I, I believe CERN will be there in a 10 years time. So um, it is uh, something that can also provide you with a sustainability and uh, with, uh, with a preservation of your information. So that was a very good question. Yes, you can you can uh, preserve the copies in many many places. The thing that you have to keep in mind is that, for example, if you put your uh, data set in Zenodo uh, and then you get a DOI, then you should not ask for a different DOI uh, from another repository in case they provide. Okay, because it is the same resource and must have the same DOI. Okay. Okay, so um, is the Nodo the recommended service from uh, for now? Uh, well, uh, I can say that the Nodo is very useful, but first you should look for a specific repository in your community because in this way you will be sure that, for example, the metadata standards that they use is uh, um, specific for your um uh, for your uh, contents. Um, we have, for example, uh, in, in Europe, there, there, is, uh, there has been uh, uh, several years, 10 years um, um, uh, projects uh, to, uh, to build research infrastructures for specific domains. Okay, so in case, for example, your data uh, are very specific, and you have a research infrastructure that uh, provides specific repositories for your data, you should deposit in this kind of repositories, okay? Um, Zenodo is recommended for what we call the long tail of science. So 
all these scientists that do not have structured uh, research infrastructure that they can refer to, uh, for example, domain specific repositories or services, uh, but it is very useful also because of the DOI, I think. So um, they, they will give you a DOI for your resource. So in case you do not have a um, specific repository for your domain, please use um, uh, Zenodo. Uh, when I say a specific repository, I mean also a repository that is widely used within your community. So uh, probably uh, if there is, you already know because you are using it already for your research. OK, it must be something that is um, recognized by your community as an, a, a repository where a trusted repository. OK. Uh, and this is part of the discussion we were having with Ahmad about the, 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 what it means to have a trusted repository and certified repository. It is often the case that you cannot really certify what the community think is something that they use often. Okay, so. Okay, so let's go back to the uh, presentation and we have a, a few slides more about the current open science practices. Uh, sorry, yes. Emma, to interrupt. There is an interesting question maybe to clarify about GitHub. Oh, sorry. It, it, it's it's yes, relevant I probably see. to say. Do you have an opinion? <laughs> yeah, we are discussing about it now. Um, choosing do not have country restriction considerations. I do not understand fully the question uh, the questions uh, that Mehmet uh, asked, as I remember open science repository choosing, do not mm. have country restrictions, considerations? I think Ahmad was referring to the one before that. Do you have any opinions regarding GitHub? Okay, so we can, uh, maybe we can take this after um, the presentation because we're going to discuss about GitHub in a moment. Okay, so just keep uh, using the question and, and answer uh, button if you have to any questions about that, and we can uh, resume. Um, the, yeah, per perhaps I can uh, reply to Mehmet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Uh, yes, there are no country restrictions uh, in choosing your repository, but it would be good. I mean, if you want to uh, keep them in your institution, and your institution has one. Uh, and there are no thematic repositories out there, it, it would be a good practice to keep them there. Um, that's my, my answer to yeah. that. It's also often the case that if your institution has a repository, uh, often they also have a policy and, and rules uh, to follow uh, about the repository. So uh, often you are required to deposit in your institutional repositories. So um, it can be that uh, you have to, <laughs> but then you can also um, deposit uh, everywhere else. Okay. So uh, let's discuss about how to uh, embrace open science in your domain. Um, so we have discussed about the file sharing. There are a lot of services out there. And then you also have, um, uh, software management tools. We have GitHub, but also others. Um, but uh, still, uh, even if you 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 are um, how to say, um, I can advise you to use uh, these kind of software management tools because they are very very useful to deploy software. Uh, for example, GitHub. Uh, there is something that is missing. So everything that you have seen in the previous slide. So services for data sharing, we're talking about the Dropbox, uh, uh, Google Drive, uh, GitHub for uh, software management. Uh, they do not publish your products in the academic sense because publishing means that there is a venue where um, you publish it that is recognized by the academic community, for example, scientific uh, um, journals. OK, uh, I want to tell you something about this uh, in a moment. Uh, publishing your products also means that uh, your products can be preserved. Uh, and we have seen uh, uh, preserved means that they will be there for a long time. Uh, 
um, making your you these kind of services that we have seen in the previous slides do not make your product citable and findable. Okay, so they do not, for example, assign a, a PID to your product, um, and uh, they they um, do not carry attribution and scientific credit. So uh, people again uh, will uh, will not be able to cite your product uh, in the academic way, um, and they do not enable reproducibility because reproducibility is complex. Uh, and uh, storing your information, your resource somewhere does not really allow reproducibility, okay? You need all the rest of the FAIR principle to be applied to your product. Uh, for example, you should make your product interoperable. Um, you should link it to other resources and so on. Uh, this is a very, very nice tweet. Uh, a few years ago, someone wrote, you can download your, our code from the URL, uh, URL supplied. Good luck downloading the only postdoc who can get it run. Okay, though, so um, this is true. Uh, sharing does not mean that you are um, um, that you are um, compliant with the fair principle. There is a lot of more. Okay, so what can you do? Um, well, um, you can make your data and your software fair. Uh, we have seen that uh, there are some p some some um, specific technical specification that can help us in making our data fair. Our software can make can be made fair as well. So use ORCID to identify the, the authors or the contributors because so these will make them findable. Uh, try to develop in a structured or a collaboratory and open way. Uh, and this is where GitHub helps you. But then this is not it, uh, because as we saw, GitHub uh, will not um, uh, publish your software in the academic way, but you need more. And what you need is that you need to deposit and preserve in a trustworthy repository and get a DOI, so a PID that can identify your resource. And this can be done through Zenodo. You have to choose a clear license because this way people will know what they can do with your data and your software. Uh, Deposit and update, uh, if needed, a readme file uh, with your code or in, in your data, uh, because these will tell people, uh, document to your people how this code or this data were uh, um, created uh, or collected, um, the context of the code and the data. And this way, people can really reuse your data and understand your code better. Um, use versioning. This is very important, especially for software. Um, and link to other research objects. Okay, link to data, to software, to articles, to whatever you need to make your research um, understandable. Uh, okay, so um, let's see what Zenodo is. Uh, Zenodo is a catch-all repository. As I said, it is uh, maintained by CERN and it was uh, developed thanks to a collaboration between CERN and OpenAir. Uh, so uh, it can be trusted um, because uh, these are um, long, long-term initiatives and institutions. Uh, Zenodo allows you to get a DOI for free. Uh, this DOI can be used for citation and uh, uh, it can, for this reason, enable a credit mechanism. So your, um, your resource will be easy to find and to cite. Uh, so you can see here um, that Zenodo provides a DOI. Uh, you can see here that there's a link 
to GitHub. And I'm going to tell you in a moment how this can be done. Uh, Zenodo, just let me go back a little bit. If you see in the right um, hand, in the right hand side of, of the Zenodo uh, screenshot, you will find a phrase which says site as. So this is very important because this way Zenodo provides a simple uh, method to cite uh, resources. You can simply copy and paste this. Uh, can be seen as something very simple, but believe me, when you have to cite something that is not an article, people will get confused and they will not know how to cite it. But this way, everything that is included in Zenodo will have a citation that can be copied and pasted, and people will cite you more and more easily. Uh, so as we said, uh, citable products are findable reusable and uh, uh, therefore uh, enable degrees of airiness. By this we mean uh, they can be they they can uh, the resources can be reproducible. Um, uh, you can replicate uh, for example an experiment and so on. So not only you can reuse but you can reproduce, replicate and so on. So there are a number of initiatives around software. Uh, this uh, is a Software Heritage. It is an international initiative to preserve software. These people also uh, are, are are going to uh, through uh, paper software, and they are go uh, and they are digitalizing software, and uh, they are providing a a place where you can enable, uh, you can preserve your software in the years. This is a very good, a good initiative that I wanted to, uh, to mention. Then there is another resource that you can use, which is which are the software and data papers. Now these are a specific kind of uh, scientific literature. So. Uh, but the, the main aim of a software or a data paper is to describe a software or a data set, okay? So you do not, um, in, in software and data paper, you do not tell people what you did uh, thanks to your software or, or what conclusion you reached thanks to your data, but instead you describe fully the software and the data. Uh, because they are, uh, software, because they are scientific papers, you will get a DOI attached to the article. So you can cite directly the article describing the software or the article describing the paper. However, um, the software and the data itself should be cited on the same basis as another research product if they are available. Uh, so, if a software or data paper exists and it contains results uh, that are important to the work, then the software and data paper should also be cited in addition to the software and data. Not always it is the case that you have the software paper and also the software shared, okay? So, in this case, please cite the software paper. Uh, if instead the software or the data set is provided separately as a specific resource, you should, you should cite that instead. There are a number of data paper journals. Uh, uh, for example, Nature has a, a scientific data, which is a data paper journal. Um, data in brief, which is issued by Elsevier, Data, MDPI, Patterns, Biodata Intensive Science. So these are some kind of uh, um, uh, data journals that you can um, think of publishing in. Uh, software paper journals are also uh, very common. Uh, we have a list here, probably you already know some of them. Uh, but then we should go uh, and make another step. So what are the best efforts that, that you can make towards reproducibility? Uh, so first of all, you uh, should think of uh, archiving your article preprints in public repository. We have seen that it is uh, almost all the time the case that you can archive a preprint as an open access version of your paper. So archive the preprint. Then please publish the postprints 
of a published article. So if the journal is closed and not open access, please provide the postprint in public repository, of course, in respect to copyrights, but please um, consider doing this because this way your article will be open to anyone. Uh, maybe after an embargo period, uh, but uh, if you think of the article that you that you read in your research, it is often the case that, for example, you read an article that was issued last year. Okay, so often the the, the embargo period is about uh, twelve months. Uh, can be up to uh, 24 or 36 for a specific discipline, but it is not uh, your case. So how many times you, you happen to use uh, and read an article that was published more than 12 months before? Well, in this case, if you have deposited your postprint in, in, in a repository, then your article will be available after 12 months time or six or whatever it is, the embargo period of your journal. Then publish your data and software in an open repository, as open as possible, as closed as necessary. Um, and this uh, will give people uh, the information they need that, that are described in the article. Try to also publish data and software papers to describe your products and keep your products uh, semantically interlinked. That means to give all the necessary information to link the product. So you have seen Zenodo is a very good solution because it allows you to give, uh, to put links in your, in your, um, uh, between your, your resources. Um, then you can also share on the web. I mean, there is no, um, you, you can of course tweet about your research. Uh, you can put your things in your website. It's perfectly fine, but Please, before doing that, be sure that everything is in place in a trusted uh, place and can be uh, preserved. Now, this is um, what I wanted to tell you with my slides. And uh, what I want to do now is that I will open the comments and the question in Mentimeter for you. And in the meanwhile, please let me um, uh, let me just find a useful resource, which is the link between GitHub and OpenAir. I want to share with you and show you. I don't know if we have any questions uh, in the, no, no. the chat. OK, so please feel free also to use uh, Mentimeter to, uh, to comment. Um, I would Ellie, ask. Yes. yes. Sorry, I would Sorry. ask. Uh, what is the the biggest challenge that you you see when applying fair principles? Like now that you you know about fair, fair principles, what is for you the the biggest challenge? Thank you. While you think about what to write in, in the Mentimeter, or if you have any question, I want to share with you this. Okay, so this is a, um, uh, it is a guide from GitHub. Uh, there is a, um, how to say, an initiative uh, joined by GitHub and Zenodo. Um, the thing is, you can use GitHub to deploy your software, okay? Design and develop your software. And then GitHub allows you to link everything to the Zenodo uh, to deposit a copy of the status of your, uh, your software in Zenodo and then be assigned a DOI. Now, this is very important because as you, uh, as you learned, uh, this will allow you to uh, publish your software in the academic sense. Uh, so you will need uh, uh, to simply um, choose what resources to, um, uh, to deposit in Zenodo via uh, GitHub. So once you're done with your software and you're happy with it, uh, you can choose what they called in, in, uh, um, in GitHub a repository. And then 
this repository can be shared through the Zenodo. Then you log in and you link, uh, authorize the, the exchange of information. Uh, you can archive uh, the repository that you choose. Uh, checking the repository settings, and you can also create new releases. Uh, this way, your software will be attached a DOI and will be present in Zenodo. Uh, but then, if you go on and you uh, develop uh, some extra uh, extra versions of your software, these will be linked in Zenodo as well. Uh, so, if you have a new release, you can uh, link everything in in um, in Zenodo. Okay, so you will have a DOI and your resource will be published. Now, the example that I had in my slide was, was a piece of software coming from GitHub that was developed by, uh, by the, the open air team. So as you see, it is, um, uh, it is possible and very simple to, uh, to uh, transfer everything in Zenodo and to get a DOI for your code. Okay, so I'm putting in the chat, sorry, I put uh, everyone. I put in the chat the link for this resource so that you can go and check. Uh, I hope this can be useful. Now we go back to the minting meter. Okay, I see someone is typing. Okay. Okay, uh, I see data journal from MDPI in your slide. I think it was in some sort of blacklist for journals, but sometimes uh, and then be removed, but still have some unsupported concerns about it. Can we say MDPI journals are not predatory? Okay, this about predatory journals is is very, very, uh, it's, it's a very large conversation. Okay, uh, first of all, there is no, uh, there they were some attempts for having blacklists in the in the past, but it's very, very difficult to uh, even uh, describe what a predatory journal is. Um, now, there are some guidelines that you can use. I, I showed you in my slides before um, that you can use, for example, the DOIJ, uh, directory to understand if a journal is is uh, trustable. Uh, you can use uh, the think uh, um, a check submit button to to understand if your uh, the, the chosen journal is is uh, trustable. Uh, there were some attempt to uh, have a list of uh, of uh, mm, characteristics for a predatory publisher, and guess what? It was demonstrated that Elsevier had all the characteristics of, of a, um, a predatory publisher. So it is a very, very thin, um, how to say, boundaries that we are wor uh, walking at. Uh, it is often the case that uh, some publisher are considered predatory, predatory for, for a while and then they do not uh, for for the future, so uh, it is very very difficult to say. Um, I've heard someone else saying that MDPI journals can be considered predatory, but this was often because they insist a lot and send you a lot of emails. But instead, that they, uh, I had this conversation. I'm, I'm telling you that uh, because I had this conversation today with uh, with a person with Ilaria uh, Ellie that you know, um, and uh, from uh, DOJ, but also Ellie is from from DOJ, so she can confirm MDPI is not considered a, a predatory publisher, but sometimes they do have some, some uh, how to say, some, uh, um, they, they insist uh, a lot, of, for example, for the emails and so, 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 yeah, sometimes they, they can be um, a, a bit uh, too much, but instead they are a good publisher. So Elia, I don't know if you want to add something. We had a similar conversation this morning with a, with a person uh, that was uh, asking us if uh, one of the journals they issue, which is called the Minerals, is is a predatory journal. But uh, it looked to us that uh, this uh, editorial board was pressing for uh, a response and asking many times to become a reviewer or something. So this is not really uh, the only thing for predatory journals. Ali? 
No, no, I don't have something to add. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I talk too much. <laughs> Uh, so I don't know if you if I answered your your question. Um, I can also maybe. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I was going to link this uh, this uh, uh, Bjorn Brems um, uh, blog about uh, Alsevier as a predatory journal. But go on. I'm just going to find. No, I wanted to just uh, add. Uh, we, it's one of the questions that I receive very often when. Uh, People after a training uh, or they or a session similar to ours, uh, after they go and search for um, a journal in the Serpa Romeo, often sometimes they don't find something, and this is because they are trying to find information about conferences, conference proceedings. So uh, there are two things that apply for conference proceedings. Either you have to look at who is uh, the main publisher and check these policies of, of that publisher. Um, either some, uh, some records are already included in Serpa Romeo, but it's very rare that you will find um, uh, records only for conferences. I know that there are some publishers that uh, try to, to do that and are very, um, are very good in providing timely information about this. And the third is that you have to look at, if you don't find uh, information neither in Sirpa Romeo or in uh, the publisher page, but then you have to look at the copyright agreement that they have sent to you. Uh, we see that most of the times they uh, have uh, some, uh, some uh, information there, some text that uh, reads as you can, uh, you know, uh, after submitting, you can deposit uh, in an open access uh, repository or, or something like that. Okay, so we have, uh, uh, I see there is something in the chat. Um, that was my question, thank you very much. Uh, to avoid it, to be honest, my reviews are not as hard as in the journals in my area. It seems for me quite easy to publish there, and I think that it will be against me at some point if I publish much there because it looks that you publish there because you can pay it, or that is what other researchers say. Yes, this is often the case that people think that they they um, uh, merge. The fact that a journal is open access uh, and requires APC, uh, and then um, this makes people think that since authors pay, then um, the, the peer reviewers or the editor will be much more likely happy to accept a manuscript. But think also that uh, uh, nature is asking thousands of euros for publishing so uh, and and you <laughs> probably will not think that since you're paying for publishing in nature then nature is is a predatory journal or the the quality of the papers are uh, are um, not so high because you're paying for publishing okay so uh, do not uh, confuse uh, the fact that the business model of of a uh, uh, a journal with the quality of the journal itself. And this is very important. Um, in computer science, there is Horatio is, is telling us that in computer science, the core ranking is quite reliable for conferences. Okay, so there is a rank for conferences. Okay, thank you, um, Horatio. Um, Okay. May I profit maybe from yes, this time to, of course. to add a few words since we are also talking in, in the context of Chistera uh, and then I can jump back to, to the different points you've said that you've uh, covered today. So um, just to remind and to somehow link back to what I've said uh, at the beginning of the session yesterday. Uh, so starting from next year, so the call that will open uh, in December this month, um, of course, we, we, we would require, we have already required before open access, 
for all publications funded by Chistera, but now we eliminate any embargo. So we really go along the lines of the of the plan S and, and fully implement open access without embargoes. Um, and, and for data as well, we require uh, data to be shared on, on fair enabling data repositories. Now, of course, this will apply for the next call in, in, a, in a strict sense, but obviously everyone who is already funded by Chistera is, is encouraged to follow those good practices because those are really the good uh, open uh, scientific practices. And in fact, many, many Chistera researchers already follow such practices. Voila. Okay, great. So you're warned, these are the rules that are coming. These are the opportunities, actually. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, this is, uh, this is true. Uh, it is a very good, uh, it's a great opportunity. And uh, the thing is that we, we need to start changing our mentality. And uh, I mean, science and, and the scientific progress is, uh, is a something that we do for the society. So we should try it as much as possible to um, to easy this process and to allow others to start and reuse our our results. Um, so yes, uh, there was a, there was something that I wanted to tell you before when I was uh, talking about the fact that one thing is to make uh, your uh, results available, for example, on a website or on GitHub, and one other thing is publishing it in the academic sense. Uh, so I had a, yesterday a very nice conversation with uh, an American uh, researchers in sociology. And this person uh, called us because we uh, are managing um, um, a community in Zenodo uh, about COVID-19. And apparently, um, I probably, probably all of you know about the Young Report which was this uh, report written by this uh, scientist uh, that uh, was meant to prove that the, the uh, COVID, uh, the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus was created into a, in, in a laboratory. Um, so this report is actually uh, one of the records of Zenodo. So uh, because these scientists uh, deposited the report in Zenodo. Uh, so she called us to understand why we we were hosting this uh, this report, and uh, we had a very long conversation. But the the um, uh, final remark is that this way this report was published in the academic sense. So it has uh, it is in our repository. It is marked as a preprint. Uh, it has a DOI. So now uh, the thing is other scientists can start a conversation and can start discussing about this record. And uh, apparently they can also cite it uh, in order to say, okay, I do not agree with this uh, young report for these, these and these reason. Now, if this report was instead published on a blog, uh, it, it could be out of the scientific discussion because researchers are actually discussing their papers about others' papers and about others' resources that are um, recognized as scientific product. Uh, it is not often the case that, for example, it never happens that you are discussing in your paper about, let's say, a software that was published on, on a blog. Uh, but instead, if the same software was published in a software paper, you probably could discuss about it. So it is quite interesting to see that there is still um, how to say uh, there are some some structured um, there is a structured way uh, that the where the discussion takes place uh, for science uh, and this is quite quite interesting to think about so this is why you should publish in Zenodo because then everyone will will understand that this is a part of a scientific product. Okay, don't know if you have any other questions or remarks, doubts, something that is not clear.
Okay, so uh, I guess so we can uh, we can probably close the module here. Next time, Ellie will tell you more about uh, the search data management and data management plan, right, Ellie? Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's about data management plans uh, and Argos, how to use the, the Opener tool for creating data management plans, and uh, about uh, how you can use uh, all the, well, not all, but the, a majority of some of the tools that were mentioned uh, during uh, Emma's uh, sessions. Yes, uh, not yesterday, it was on Wednesday and today. So uh, yes, this is what we'll be uh, viewing together next yes um there is a question github is linked to microsoft correct is there any hidden important things to keep in mind about this <laughs> well i don't know how to answer this question i i don't think there is any hidden things um behind <laughs> this i don't know yes ellie amazon also is uh, the majority of the storage that the universities use yes for, yes oh, no, also google storage, so yes i mean these are these are uh, inevitable um this mm -mm. is inevitable yes i mean we're using zoom platform uh, to to have this uh um, this record. I mean, it's not always, I mean, these are services, so uh, it's not always bad to use uh, private services. It is, the fact is, we have to be, um, how to say, we have to be sure that we understand the terms of use of what we're using. <laughs> so this is the good, uh, yeah. And I would say that the collaborations are done via agreements. So mm -hmm. agreements also uh, include, the, uh, you know, data transfer and data protocols and so on. So uh, it's good uh, to have uh, those in place. So th this allows us to use it in an academic way, use the services in an academic yeah. way. Yes, which is different from uh, the, the um, free uh, services that you can get. For example, Google services that I that I showed you, I think I believe in the first module, that terms of use was about the, the free service uh, that you can use with your uh, Google account, uh, your personal Google email and, uh, and uh, uh, Google Drive, but uh, they have different kind of terms and conditions, for example, for the service that they provide to uh, uh, academic institutions. So you should be aware of what are the terms of services um, uh, of, of this commercial uh, service. Yeah, I agree. And you, yes, yeah, I agree. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So, um, Jean disagree. Um, I disagree. GAFA hosted platforms could or should be avoided if academia provided equivalent solution yes this should mm -hmm. be but but it's not um, always the case that uh, they can provide um, equivalent solutions so this is what uh, was also included in my previous um, module uh, if you have a better option use it i mean if your institutions provides you with a storage service uh, or with with uh, sharing services that you can use uh, for for uh, um, sharing information with your colleagues, that is perfectly fine. But then if you do not have your institution supporting you in this, then you should find another way. Uh, in our Tisera project, we strictly avoid Google Drive, Zoom, and so on. Yes, this is uh, completely fine. Uh, I mean, I use a, a, a variety of different uh, solutions in different projects, but this often depends on uh, what are the partners involved and uh, if there is actually a partner that can provide a, a different solution. So, yes. There is also Microsoft OneDrive if mm -hmm. you want Microsoft accounts. Yeah. For academic reasons, like it's tied to the affiliation affiliated institution that you're using. So yes. again, data agreements and uh, those things apply. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Um, so yes, I think uh, I think uh, we can uh, we can close the sessions if we have no further remarks. Uh, so I want to thank you for being here today. And uh, I will put uh, all material in Zenodo and, and then uh, Hamada, will you take care of, uh, of sharing all the links with the participants? Um, um, yeah, well, we have to, to, to discuss this setting together to, to find the best way to, to reaching out and, and share the, the links. Okay. The, 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 the fastest possible. We, can, we could discuss this uh, after, the, uh, after the session. Okay, but definitely great. let's yeah find the quickest and easiest solution okay great okay many thanks to everyone and uh, i'll see you next week thank you thank you